Hey guys, I'm Dave from MyGunValues.com. I will welcome you back here. This is part two of our series on the 30 carbine. If you haven't seen part one, I encourage you to go back and check it out. In part one, I covered the, uh, the ammunition that this gun uses and the fact that the ammunition uh, predates the gun, actually. The ammunition's been around longer than the gun. In part two, what I thought we'd do is we'd cover the actual gun itself and this is probably going to be two three parts um, I don't like the videos to get too long a lot of people don't have time to watch endless videos for you know 30 45 minutes so what I thought we would cover in this video is the development of the of the gun and show you some differences from this one versus what originally came out. Um, now this gun, this gun is a 1960s purchase from the Director of Civilian Marksmanship. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of it, the DCM is a program even to this day that was designed to, pr to promote marksmanship after World War II and if you log on to their website you can see the requirements you can still purchase guns from them if available if you qualify and their qualifications are up there you have to be a member of a shooting organization um, just having a hunting license doesn't qualify um, you know be a range member be a competitor and they're, they're, they have all of their specifications laid out. But anyway, the original owner of this, I'm the second owner since it came from the DCM. The original owner from this uh, purchased it from them in 1965. According to him, and when the D, they came out of the DCM, they were completely reworked, gone over, brought up to specs, and then sold back then. That was the way they did things. He said the last time he fired it was approximately 1975. He probably never put more than 100 rounds down the tube. Um, so if you know me at all, you know that I don't do safe queens. Even though this gun is in extremely nice condition as a rework, this gun's going to get a workout. So and as soon as I can shoot, you know, as soon as my water level out there drops to safe, this gun's going to get some rounds down it. So the original, as I said in the last video, the original carbine was designed around the cartridge. There were a lot of prototypes that were submitted to the Army. None of them passed. Winchester at the time felt they were, they were already busy with other projects. They didn't feel they could get a prototype ready in time. When none of the other prototypes of the first, rounds of first round of testing proved satisfactory, Winchester had another rifle they were working on, what they would hoped it would replace the M1 Garand. Um, there was a gentleman by the name, last name of Williams. He became known as Carbine Williams, and you can read about his story. Um, mechanically, he was a genius, and he had designed this rifle around a new system he had devised. What the Army wanted was Winchester to take that rifle and shrink it down to a hot five and a half pound carbine. They did that in just a couple of weeks. It was quite quite amazing. And by the end of 1941, just about the time we entered World War II, this, this carbine was considered ready to go. The original M1 carbines had a sight back here that simply flipped up and down. It had one post that was ostensible, or one hole in it that was ostensibly for 150 yards, and it had another one that was supposed to be for 300 yards. Wasn't liked by the troops, wasn't well received. So one of the changes that was made was the addition of this adjustable sight here. The adjustable sight was later retrofitted to almost every one of these. So 
to find a 1941 or 42 with its original flip-up site and original configuration, that usually drives the price way up. The, the rear sight was replaced and almost all of them were subsequently replaced. So to find one with the original flip-up sight is actually quite rare today and actually adds significantly to the value. They later come out, came out with the M2 version, which was select fire. It was, it was, it was capable of fully automatic fire. Um, there are some of those out there that people can own you know, today, but you have to go through all the NFA. I unfortunately, living in Washington, Washington is one of nine states in the country that does not allow fully automatic firearms. And uh, that's one of the reasons that as soon as I can, I will be moving to Wyoming, as I've alluded to before. Uh, this summer, my wife and I will be on the property, and I'll, I'll shoot a video from there showing you the property and showing you the plans. You know, and it's, it's a two or three year project, but that's, that's what we're shooting for. So hopefully someday I'll be able to get some full autos and uh, show you some of those. But anyway, after the M2 carbine with full auto that came out with the M3, which had a night sight. And it was really helpful for Japanese trying to crawl through the lines at night. And there were, there were a few minor little changes along the way. But, you know, they had ones with folding wire stocks. They relocated the magazine release. This is the magazine release here. This particular gun is, is a 1945, or late 1944, early 1945 production. Um, the safe, this is the magazine release here. But what they had problems with, there were reports, the safety's here. So as you can see, you got the safety in the magazine release, and they had problems with the troops punching the, the magazine release instead of the safety. So that became an issue, so it was moved. And uh, because even though Winchester designed it, their other wartime commitments kept them from manufacturing a lot. There were actually 12 manufacturers of this carbine. The... Winchester is actually fairly rare, and this actually is a Winchester production. And I can't show it to you because I really don't feel like dismounting the sight. But right here is the serial number, right back here on the tang. And right above it is the word Winchester, and you can just see it from the side. So this is a Winchester built model. It's certainly not the most valuable. The... Uh, I believe the Rock Ola, which was a jukebox company, is probably the most valuable, although I would have to check the website. They were issued with this sling and this little two-pouch magazine here, magazine carrier that, that slung over the sling and the buttstock. And they were just designed for rear echelon troops, cooks, mechanics, um, you know, hospital personnel, mortarmen. They were designed for people that, whose main job was not being right on the very front lines in battle, although they were a lot of them were carried in battle this way. But they weren't, that wasn't their intended purpose. Their intended purpose originally was to replace the Tommy gun and the 45, and they didn't do either one. They just got thrown into the mix with everything else. It is the most, produ most produced World War II firearm. There's more of these that were produced than the M1 Garand. And just one more little interesting tidbit on history. This gun has been used, now not all of it legitimately, but this gun was used and issued to troops by 56 different nations over its history, and it's still in use by six nations today for police, guard, and parade duty. The one I know off the top of my head is Brazil, but there's five other ones that still use it to some degree this, to this day. So I just thought I would give you the basic history of the gun. And after, uh, after this, we will go through, you know, the magazines, the loading. I'm not going to, probably not going to strip this down. I think that's kind of silly. Because um, this had an enclosed gas system. It didn't have a lot of problems, need a lot of maintenance. And, uh. 
then that, that'll wrap up, probably wrap up the series until we get to the uh, actually being able to shoot this gun. So, but for now, I want to thank you for watching. Um, you know, if you're curious, check out the MyGunValues.com website, and we encourage you to subscribe here and post your comments here. Have a good day.